This world does not know God. Learn why mankind has been in spiritual darkness for thousands of years. Discover how to develop a relationship with your Creator, next on The Key of David with Gerald Flurry. Greetings, everyone. The greatest relationship God has or a man, man has with God by far is, uh, is his relationship with his Creator. Now, that is really uh, the worst relationship man has, that is his relationship with God, and he is frankly bewildered and confused about all of this, and it's a total mystery to him. It is a mystery. The greatest mystery of all, and this is listed in Mr. Armstrong's book, Mystery of the Ages, but the greatest mystery of all is who and what is God? Now look around in, the, in this world, and, and uh, I tell you, you, you won't find people understanding this. I want to just quickly read those seven mysteries that are listed in Mr. Armstrong's book. Mystery of the Ages. Herbert W. Armstrong wrote that. And the first one is, uh, Who and what is God? The second one is, The mystery of the angels and the evil spirits. Number three is, The mystery of man. Who and what is man? Number four, Mystery of civilization. What are we, why are we so confused about building a civilization? Number five, The mystery of Israel. So, the Bible is a book about Israel. We have to know that. Verse, or excuse me, number six, the mystery of the church, and number seven, the mystery of the kingdom of God. Those are the seven mysteries that I want to be talking to you about in a few programs. And I, I think nothing is more important for us to understand, and it certainly is the most important book, I believe, to give you an understanding of the Bible and remove all the mystery from that Bible. That's what it's all about. But look at those seven mysteries closely and talk to people in the world and they simply do not understand them. They don't understand them. And here we are facing the worst suffering ever on this earth. Our number one problem is that of human survival, WMDs, weapons of mass destruction, proliferate this, this world. And we say, well, uh, what, we, what can we do to solve those? We think, but, but it, we have to realize that the cause of those problems is man. And if we're ever going to solve them, we're going to have to solve man's nature or human nature. You go and to, before any institution in this world and ask them to explain those seven mysteries, and they can't do it. Not one. Not one. And yet there is a great prophecy in Isaiah 40 where it says, There is the voice crying out because God is revealing that, or those mysteries to this world. He, reveal, he is giving us a book so that we can understand the Bible. And there, this book, Mystery of the Ages, is a synopsis, a synopsis of the entire Bible, or like an a outline summary, we could say. But I want to show you one of the most horrendous prof or pictures in the Bible. It is dual, and it's all so far this end time. It's about God's own church and how they have rebelled against Him in this end time, and also about three particular nations of Israel. And if you don't know who Israel is, well, you can write for our book or request our book on the United States and Britain and prophecy, and it will explain all that to you. But this verse, actually several verses here, where it, where it God explains something that is critical for us to understand. Herbert W. Armstrong was visiting New Delhi, India at one time as he was being driven around in a taxi to make a visit with the Prime Minister. At that time, 
he noticed these cattle that were just walking all over the city and, uh, and he asked the uh, driver, well, don't these uh, cattle and ox go a, a long way, a quite a distance from uh, their uh, owner? And he, he said, oh yes, they certainly do. Well, he, Mr. Armstrong asked him the question, well, uh, how do the owners find them at night and bring them back home? And he said, oh, they don't have to do that at all. The ox or the cattle know where their home is and they find their own way. And Mr. Armstrong said immediately he thought about a scripture. So let me read it to you. I've read this before, but it is absolutely critical to understand if we're going to understand who and what is God. Isaiah 1, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. This is, oh, this is a message for the entire earth, all the inhabitants of the earth. For the Eternal has spoken, God. this is God speaking, I have nourished and brought up children, those are the children of Israel, and they have rebelled against Me, the church and the children of the uh, nations of Israel. The ox knows his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel does not know, my people does not consider, ah, oh, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, of evil doers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the eternal, they are gone away backward. See, this is a message to ancient Israel, it's a message to Israel today primarily because Isaiah is an end time book. It's for us today, but if Israel, the only nation that anciently that ever knew God and knew who and what God was, well, uh, what about the other nations who've never known God? You know they don't. They don't know who and what God is. Of course they don't. And of course, as a result of that, God is not real to them. Think about that. Uh, th th this, this program and this book is really to make God real to us, and really real, <laughs> like your own father. Now that's quite a statement to make, but that is what Mr. Armstrong explains in this book. God needs to be real to us, as real as your own physical father. Is that true of you? Is that true of me? Well, I think we could all see room for growth in that area. Verse 4 says, Ah, sinful nation, and today it's sinful nations, three nations of Israel in particular. But he says, A people laden with iniquity, iniquity or sinfulness or lawlessness. We're just weighted down with it. Why we, don't we understand who and what God is? Because we're just weighted down, laden down with sin and lawlessness. Now that this is God's evaluation of us, and He, it, he says they have forsaken the eternal. They, they have forsaken God. Those nations I mentioned, and also God's own church, and really you have to say, well, this is a, a horrifying picture that we have to see here that God has prophesied, and He said, this is, God has spoken this Himself. How important is that? Laden, that word means great, heavy, hard, grievous. I mean, we've just been laden down and made grievous with sins. And everywhere you look, it seems like there are problems, but there are problems we can solve. We can solve them as a nation or nations. We can solve them as individuals if nations don't solve them. We can solve those problems, but we have to do something in our relationship with God. What kind of a relationship do you and I have with God? Romans 1 and verses 18 through 22, For the wrath of God is real from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of men who by their wickedness suppress the truth. As we get into wickedness, we suppress the truth. It's not that it isn't there and we don't see any truth. We suppress it. Now that's a, 
a real condemnation of our own human nature and our own and, uh, fellow men. We suppress the truth. And then it goes on to talk about God's eternal power and deity, which is spiritual, has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made physical, so that they are without excuse. For although they knew about God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. They knew, they, they knew, and they could see in that creation that this, this was made by God. And yet they didn't give honor to God. They didn't give thanks to God. They suppressed the truth that they understood and learned. Something is wrong with human nature. There's a reason why we don't know who and what God is. There's a reason why. Why is it that we don't want this most important relationship we could ever have, by far, and yet we suppress the truth. Notice that 28th verse of Romans 1. It says, They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. They don't like to retain God in their knowledge. They'd rather retain evolution or uh, theories like that. But look at around, look at the world and the people in the world. You, you can look at China where they have uh, over a billion people, and you can look at Russia, both of them really are, well, people that don't believe in God, for the most part, they are atheists. They will tell you that, at least, again, most of them will. And so, they don't know who and what God is, and they don't want to know, apparently. It seems that way. But remember the example of the Apostle Paul going before the Athenian intellectuals and scholars. And, and let me just read you a little of what it says in Acts 17, beginning in verse 18. It says this, Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, Well, what will this babbler say? And he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And it goes on to say, uh, uh, they see they had altars and monuments to all gods. They, did, they wanted to make sure they didn't skip one god, and they even had a, an altar there to the unknown god. And Paul says, now this is the one I want to talk to you about, the god you don't know. You don't know who and what god is. He just talked to all of them and told all of them they did not know. Well, isn't that amazing? Listen, if we just use our minds and think, we can rather easily prove God exists, and God is alive, and we can know who and what He is. Now, even if you go to educational institutions and in our society, you might ask them if they believe in God, and they'll probably say, well, I, I believe in a uh, God as a first a cause or something like that, but they do not know who and what God is, and it, and I think mainly apparently don't want to know, because in the, in our educational institutions today, they really do teach, just, well, just mostly instilling uh, certain uh, beliefs and concepts into our memory, and that's what it's really about. We don't think. We ought to know. We ought to be able to think our way through a lot of this and know a lot about God, just by using the mind that is like the mind of God in, in uh, many respects. And yet, that is not taught in our educational institutions. We need to learn how to think better than what we do, and that certainly applies to me and to all of us. But Mr. Armstrong said, look, uh, the modern scientific concept denies the invisible and the spiritual as having existence, yet all our seemingly unsolvable problems and the evils in this world are spiritual in nature. Yes, they are, and they're caused by human nature and there is a way to get rid of human nature, 
by getting God's Holy Spirit. Romans 8 and verse 7 says the natural mind is hostile toward God. Do you know why God would create us where this could happen? Well, we have to learn to about who and what is God, or we can never solve our problems that we are causing and bringing upon ourselves, and we don't know how to solve them. Most people are not, let's say, maliciously hostile, but they're more passively hostile. They're not maliciously hostile toward God, for the most part, but they are still hostile, and that's the problem. Spiritual things are a mystery to people. I want to show you one of the greatest proofs that there is in the Bible. What about uh, the Trinity? And uh, it, it, the word is not found in the Bible. It, uh, what, what, what do you believe about that? Well, there's a section on that in Mystery of the Ages, Herbert Armstrong's book. But I want to show you an astounding proof that is really one of the greatest in all the Bible. If you want to go back to the beginning in, let's say, prehistory, back to the, to the very earliest time that the Bible discusses God's existence, the very earliest, most people would say, well, that would be Genesis 1 and verse 1. No, it isn't. It's in John 1 and verse 1. And let me read that to you. John 1 and verse 1. Now, this is in the time order, the earliest revelation of who and what is God. The earliest is right here. Notice what it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The Word here are the spokesman for the God family or the God Kingdom at this point. There are two personages here, or two beings, and there are no angels, no universe, and no mankind, just God and the Word. Nothing but two gods, and that's it. There isn't anything else. Now that's the earliest point in the Bible of God's existence. When only in all the universe, well, not the universe, it wasn't even there, in all of eternity, it was just God and the Word to that point. That's all there was. And there was nothing else. And it, in John 1, then, God uh, explains all this to us and shows us that God was the leader, the Word, also God and perfect, submitted to God, because two can't walk together unless they're agreed, and they had peace and harmony and joy for all eternity, and still do. But not everybody has that at all. In fact, very few people do. But notice verse 14 of John 1, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth." See, this is where God the Father, or God became the Father, and the Word became the Son. And in verse 18 it says, No man has been seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father. He has declared Him. Now let me just give you a little test here. You can work this out on your own, I think. But uh, Christ came to this earth declaring the Father. See, there's Father, Son. There was this big change in John 1 that is, is explained to us, to the Father and the Son. And there is, going to, there is coming a time when there may be as many as billions of sons that God is going to bring into His family. That is his, the purpose. Father, Son, more sons, family of God. That's what it's all about. And, it all, and there are two gods, not three, two gods, not one, two. So who and what is God? See, even all those people who have died, they're not lost. 
They're going to be brought up in a resurrection, billions of them, and they're going to get to know who and what God is if they didn't know that, and you can be almost 100% sure they didn't. Now you ought to go back, I'll just give you a scripture in Matthew 24, verses 3 through 5, and Christ said there are many people that, that are saying that I, Christ, am Christ. They're going around saying that and deceiving many. Do you know why? Because they're declaring Christ and not the Father. They're declaring the person of Christ, but not His message about the Father and the family of God. You need to think about that. You're going to have to think about it to, to uh, understand this, but it's not that difficult if you really will apply yourself and study. See, they, they, don't, they talk about Christ's person, but they don't talk about His message of declaring the Father and the family of God. Malachi 1 and verse 6 says, God's own people don't honor the Father. 95% of them don't even honor the Father. Isn't that sad? Well, I think that's the, it's not only sad, it's the biggest crisis in this end time for sure. But here was a spirit God, a spirit divinity that was begotten by, begotten as a human person. How about that? And he came down here and was crucified and killed by evil men who didn't know who and what God is. They didn't know what they were doing. Some of them knew, knew Christ was from God, but most of them didn't. But that's all a mystery to this world, I'm telling you. It's a mystery. People don't understand it. And yet we have a book, Mystery of the Ages, that will explain all that to you. And we have uh, more information on the, the Trinity and the book of Isaiah and uh, other material that we can give you. But in John 1, 1, you see, they were not father and son. And then it goes on to say, well, they became father and son. Family. Opening up that family to everybody. They all get a chance to get to know God. In Genesis 1 and verse 26 it says, Let us make man in our image or in our character, in our mind. That's, that's his plan, but already he is in the, uh, the, the after our likeness. We're already after God's likeness. We have uh, God's likeness. Did you know, and I'm sure you probably do, but that God has eyes and a face and a nose and ears and hands and legs and toes and feet and hair. He has all that. It says so in the Bible, no animal looks like God, but human beings look like God. And that tells you volumes right there, if we'll just think about that. God has created us to be like He is and to become like He is spiritually so we can be born into that family. He is recreating Himself in man. What could be more glorious to understand than that? I mean, Christ, when He came to this earth, He came as a human being. And He said, well, if you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. And uh, even Judas when he was going out at night to, to uh, betray Christ and show the enemy where he was, they, they, they bribed him to point Christ out to them. <laughs> he, was, he looked like everybody else. But it, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful world if you have the very character of God, a giving character, and it fills you with happiness and joy and understanding and gives real meaning to your life, and everything just opens up to you. But you, you know that you have to be led by Christ to get rid of that human nature so you can take on God's nature and be like God and act like God. And as Matthew 5 and verse 48 says, you can become perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now. Christ was the firstborn of many brethren. 
the firstborn of many brethren. He's just the firstborn. There are other sons to be born, brothers and sisters to Christ. And if you come out and do God's work today, you can actually be the bride of Christ. But imagine, see, he, he's just the firstborn. This is just the beginning. This is just the beginning. And you can't understand all of that unless you first understand who and what is God. You first have to understand that, and then next week we'll go on to the other mysteries. Until next week, this is Gerald Flurry. Goodbye, friends. Debate rages about the origin of life on Earth. Were we created, or did we come into existence through some other process? Can the existence of God be scientifically proven? Where did the first life come from? Can we know whether God possesses mind power? Request Herbert W. Armstrong's free booklet, Does God Exist?, for answers to these important questions. Before we can develop a relationship with God, first we must prove that God exists. No other gospel writer describes the God family vision like the Apostle John. He was the only one to explain the eternal existence of God and the world. John also showed why Christ's sacrifice should inspire us forever. Request Gerald Flurry's free book, John's Gospel, The Love of God, to learn about these foundational spiritual subjects. When Christ was on earth, he probably spent more time with John than any other apostle. This experience gave John unique insight into the depth and glory of God's master plan. Only John wrote about the mighty I am God, the resurrection of Lazarus, and how it relates to your incredible human potential, the Samaritan woman and what she means for the world, and why Jesus wept. To learn how to build God's joy in your life, study the powerful message within John's Gospel, The Love of God. Human beings can have a relationship with their Creator, but most refuse. Request Herbert W. Armstrong's booklet, Human Nature, What Is It?, to learn why mankind is naturally hostile toward God. Some say there's no evil in the heart of man. Others say man was born with an evil nature. Prove how both of these assumptions are wrong. Learn about the human nature within every person. Discover where this unique spiritual entity came from. All of our literature is available free of charge at no cost or obligation to you. Request Does God Exist? John's Gospel, The Love of God, and Human Nature, What Is It? Order now.